Thanks for joining us for Faith Meets Mental Health with our host, Kim Boswell, the Alabama Commissioner of Mental Health. We hope you enjoy this week's episode. Well, hello and welcome to Faith Meets Mental Health. I'm sitting here with our host, Commissioner Kim Boswell. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. This is such a blessing to not just us as a church, but I know the whole community. Uh, I want to ask you the question, um, why are you passionate about this particular topic? Well, thank you, Pastor Chris. Um, really, you know, I feel like all of my experiences in my life really uh, led me to the moment of being appointed as commissioner uh, by Governor Ivey. Uh, I feel like it was absolutely divine intervention in my life um, where, you know, really lots of people come up to me and say, oh, gosh, that must be a really hard job or uh, that must be very challenging. And, you know, yes, if I tried to do it in my own strength, it would be. Mm. Uh, but absolutely convinced that uh, it is a calling, it is a mission, it is my purpose at this time in my life, uh, in my spiritual journey. And of course, a lot of that comes from my own personal experience of having had some pretty significant challenges uh, the first 18 years of my life, and uh, really just working pretty hard at trying to figure out uh, how to process all of that, how to move forward, and really uh, realizing over the years that um, if I stayed really in the will of God and listening to Him, that uh, He would take all of that that had happened and really be able to use it for His glory. And so I'm very humbled by being appointed to the position and just really uh, feel very strongly about educating people about their mental health, encouraging people uh, to get counseling when they need it, and uh, really overall just helping people uh, be able to engage in community. I think probably my biggest lesson over the last 18 months is just how important connection is to our mental health. Um, we can do a lot of things you know there are certainly times when people need to take medication there are times when mm -hmm. people need more intensive treatment but the most important thing that we can do is be engaged in community mm. and the church is so central to that mm. and that is the place where so many people feel comfortable going uh, to see that we're going to now have the mental health conversation mm -hmm. in that context is just really, really exciting. So happy to be here hosting the podcast. What was the most important thing you do each day as commissioner? Um, it starts in the morning when I get out of bed and I do my morning meditation and uh, conversation with my Heavenly Father, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um if I don't start my day like that, it can go off the rails really <laughs> fast. Because in my job, uh, there's always going to be drama. Mm. You know, um, this past week, uh, we're really struggling at our facilities, our hospitals in Tuscaloosa with staffing, and we got mm. to a really scary number. And so, you know, when you're thinking about people's lives, uh, and you have your individuals in the hospitals and your staff and you're concerned about mm -hmm. their safety, it, it could be really easy to get overwhelmed with that and think, oh, my gosh, you know, what if somebody gets hurt? What's going to happen? But, you know, one of the things when I realized the staffing was uh, at that place, uh, certainly took some steps to address that, but also sent out my text to Sunday school to everybody I'm like look I need you guys to pray mm -hmm. that that nobody will get hurt everybody will be safe until mm -hmm. we can just sort this out and so really the most important thing I can do is turn my day over to my Heavenly Father because otherwise it you know it's going to be a challenging day but when I know that I've done that 
I really know that there's really nothing that's going to happen that he can't handle. Mm-hmm. There might be some stuff I can't handle, <laughs> but there's really nothing that's going to happen that he can't handle. That's right. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for watching Faith Meets Mental Health on WFRZ. Please enjoy this clip from our 2022 Faith Meets Mental Health Summit. I'm so glad to see you all here today. I'm especially glad to see our folks from Birmingham in the back from the Love Lady Center. I had the opportunity to go visit their program on Thursday of this week, and it is a phenomenal faith-based ministry. And thank you, Kim and Chris. Uh, I'm so grateful to Pastor Chris for supporting this summit, for supporting the mental health of our church, and supporting the mental health of our community. As many of you know, Pastor Chris came to us right in the middle of COVID, uh, right as we were isolating. And so we got to have a conversation about uh, mental health really because of the COVID crisis as well. And as we know, COVID really rocked the nation's mental health. We all had to stop and think about how we needed to take care of our mental health. And just like physical health, we really do have to figure out strategies to stay mentally healthy. We also learned through that process that isolation is the absolute worst thing we can do for our mental health. And we also learned that we could talk about mental health in a way that we never had before. And so if there was anything positive that came out of COVID, it was that it opened up a conversation about mental health that we've never seen before. And really, we're here today because of that conversation and because we've really made some significant headway when it comes to stigma. And so I'm just so grateful to be a part of a church community that wants to help address the mental health issue. And probably today, some of you are sort of asking yourself, what can I do about mental illness and addiction? Well, I'm here to tell you today that we all have the power to change lives through relationships. More than anything else, being able to feel safe with other people defines mental health. There is healing power in fellowship and relationships, and now we have the brain science to prove it. Our Heavenly Father understood it from the very beginning, but now we have science that says absolutely connectedness and relationships are extremely important. The nature and quality of our relationships is the very healing power we need. It's really interesting when I tell people what I do, uh, I get a lot of different reactions. (laughs) Sometimes they say, man, that must be a really challenging job, or wow, that must be really stressful. And it always makes me smile because I know it's the cue from the Holy Spirit to tell people what my Heavenly Father has done in my life. So if I told you the story of the first 18 years of my life, the neglect, the abandonment, the violence, you would probably question how in the world I even became a functioning adult. Certainly you would never think that I would become the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. But all praise and glory to my Heavenly Father, he had a different plan. Genesis 50:20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what he is now doing, the saving of many lives. My job is a calling, it is a ministry. None of the trials, none of, the, none of it was meaningless. God used every ounce of that to prepare me, to grow me spiritually, and to prepare to serve him and serve people with mental illness. So today I really want to talk about the role of disconnection and loneliness and the role that that plays in increased anxiety, depression, and substance use. I want to talk a little bit about the brain science and the power of relationships and also how relationships really helped my spiritual growth as I went along the journey of life. There was a defining moment in my life where I made a decision about how I would operate in the world. 
Four years ago, through the grace and mercy of my Heavenly Father, he showed me a beautiful painting, and it reminded me of a decision that I made at the ripe old age of seven. So if you guys can put up the, the photo. This beautiful painting is of a woman walking a tightrope over the city of Chicago. I was minding my own business at dinner one evening, and the artist who uh, painted this painting was showing us this picture and talking about what a challenge it is to depict wind blowing in a painting. He said, this woman is over the city of Chicago, but she's walking a tightrope, but she has her destiny in her hands. I made it through dinner, but as soon as I got back to my room, I cried for several hours. As I began to pray, it brought back a decision I made a long, long time ago that would inform all of my relationships and all of my spiritual growth for the rest of my life. When I was in the first grade, my mom married her second husband and moved us to Chicago. We went there in November, the coldest part of the year. The four of us lived in a one bedroom apartment, furnished apartment in a very bad part of town. Her second husband turned out to be a gambler and an abuser. And so things were not going well. We had no money. Uh, there was a lot of conflict in the house. And shortly after Christmas, my mom attempted suicide. That was not the first time she had attempted suicide. My brother and I, I was in the first grade. My brother's 18 months older. He was in the second grade. We decided we needed an escape plan. And often when we looked out our front window, we would see nuns across the street. Didn't really know if it was a church or a school, but we decided the nuns were safe. So we made our escape plan. We decided if things got really bad, we would run down the back stairs out the front door to the nuns and we would call our grandmother. Because you see, all of our connections, all of our family connections were back in Alabama. And my grandmother was so worried about our trip to Chicago, she made us memorize the phone number, 487-3972. I still remember it. <laughs> so, we decided that that was the only way to stay safe. And in that moment, for me, I made some decisions that would actually haunt me for the rest of my life. I decided that I needed to be in charge of my life and that I didn't need to depend on anybody. You can understand how that wasn't necessarily a good game plan. Today, I wanna challenge you to think about the way we interact with abused and neglected children and traumatized adults. Based on the brain science, we now know that the behavior we see is not the result of a character flaw, a moral failing, or a lack of willpower. It's because there are changes in the brain that need to be rewired. We know that relationships and connectedness absolutely can rewire the brain. So why is this important? Child abuse and neglect is the most preventable cause of mental illness, the most common cause of substance use disorder, and a significant tr contributor to health issues such as cancer and heart disease. Think of the millions of dollars we could save in healthcare if we could really address this issue. Voices for Alabama's Children just came out with the Kids Count data book for 2022. There were a lot of disturbing statistics in that book. The one that jumped out at me the most, 48% of children in foster care are there because they have a parent who has a substance use issue. 48% of children in foster care. We know that 85 to 90% of brain development is done by age five. So early intervention is critical. 
We know that kids in pre-K are 3.5% more likely to be expelled or suspended than K through 12 combined. Now, the first time I heard that statistic, I'm like, that has to be wrong. And I talked to some folks, Dr. Cooper at Department of Early Childhood Education. Kids get kicked out of pre-K for behavior. Kids aren't required to go to pre-K so they can kick them out as often as they want. They don't have to try and figure out how to deal with their behavior. Those same kids are 10 times more likely to drop out of school and have bad academic experience. Those same kids are eight times more likely to be incarcerated later in life. A lot of what I'll talk about today is based on the work of Dr. Bruce Perry, who's a neuroscientist and a medical doctor. I love what he says about incarcerated individuals. He said, basically, they all have the same diagnosis. And when I heard that the first time, it made me sit up in my chair. I'm like, I can't wait to hear this. He says their diagnosis is, what did you think would happen? Really, what did we think would happen if folks are abused and neglected and unable to get the support that they need? I'm happy to say in Alabama that if kids are in a good first-class pre-K program, that they're not allowed to be expelled or suspended from school without first being assessed to determine where that behavior is coming from. Alabama really is doing a good job with first-class pre-K and addressing the mental health needs of the little people. We know for kids that all behavior is communication. We have a great ministry here called Transformation Montgomery that is doing a phenomenal job working with kids who have adverse life experiences. They're so good that they've recently been selected to be a training site for other programs. Brain science also has implications for the achievement gap that we see. Those of you in Montgomery know our education system here continues to struggle. For kids in a stressful environment, they don't internalize new information at the same rate as children who come into a classroom in a calm state. So what happens is, year after year, traumatized students learn slower and slower. So we shouldn't be surprised by the math scores. We shouldn't be surprised by the reading scores. At age 15, my father died in a car accident and my stepfather, my mom's third husband, was shot six times. That was the beginning of a descent into darkness for our whole family. Once again, my brother and I decided we needed a plan because <laughs> that's just kind of how we learned to roll. My brother was 16 and so he could drive. So we decided we'd start attending a little church membership of about 140 about the size of the Fraser Choir. <laughs> that is where my brother met his wife of 42 years. That's where I was saved. So when my stepfather died a year later, that little church surrounded us with love. They provided food to us. They gave us money to pay the bills. And as they would tell you, they prayed up a good husband for my mother. because. They were pretty sure she needed some help finding a new one. <laughs> they were right. He was a good one. And she stayed married to him until five years ago uh, at his death. That church made such a huge difference in my life. I was so traumatized at that point. There were a series of things that happened in my life. And honestly, if it hadn't been for that church, I'm not sure that I would have graduated from high school. In fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have. So what do we need to know today? There are many factors that shape someone's mental health. Genes, brain chemistry, their environmental factors like life experiences. We know that about 30% of people will experience some kind of mental health issue and that of that 20%, one in four will experience a serious mental illness. 
A recent Harvard survey said of factors involved in depression, the most powerful were related to connectedness. Connections were present even for individuals who were at higher risk of depression as a result of genetic vulnerability or life trauma. In other words, no matter what shapes your mental health issue, connectedness can really be a protective factor in recovery. Right now, we're raising children and youth in environments that are relationally impoverished and sensory overloaded. We've substituted texts, tweets, and Facebook posts for conversations. Despite all the advancements in our world, we're not meeting the relational needs of our children or ourselves. Our stress response systems are drained. And if you're in a situation where you're having to worry about food, shelter, or employment, your stress system is even more drained and it's more challenging. One of the best examples of a relationship building organization is known as the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a phenomenal organization. Their founder, Bill W., understood the power of connection. He created groups who followed the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. Step three is my personal favorite. Gave my will and my life over to God as I understand him. These steps and traditions are used by many other organizations, NA, Al-Anon family groups. We all know that addiction destroys relationships, especially family relationships. Bill W. understood that folks who were trying to gain some recovery needed connections until they could make amends and begin to repair the damage that had been done through their addiction. My spiritual awakening actually began in the fellowship of Al-Anon. At age 32, as I was going through a divorce, I decided that maybe my life experiences might have had an influence somewhere. <laughs> From the world's perspective, I was doing really good. I'd finished undergrad and grad school before I was 21 years old. I had a great job. From the world's view, everything looked wonderful. But my spiritual life was a wreck. God, of course, put me in the right place. I was working for a treatment center and surrounded by folks who were in long-term recovery. That's when I was introduced to Al-Anon. It was the first time I considered surrendering my life to my Heavenly Father. While I had been saved and walked the aisle, nowhere in my brain did I think that what I needed to do was surrender my life to my Heavenly Father. Because remember, at age seven, I'd already made a decision that I needed to be in charge of my life. The Fellowship of Al-Anon brought me back to my Heavenly Father and brought me into the doors of Fraser. So what can we do? Conversations promote resilience and help rewire the brain. We need to be better at listening, regulating our emotions, and reflecting. Singing, dancing, or any joyful engagement can help rewire the brain by shifting out of the fight or flight mode and increasing the capacity to manage relationships. I'm so honored to sing in a group called First Light. And I was thinking about that group because the women in that group really have dedicated years, decades, to teaching choir to little people. And I started thinking about all the thousands of brains that got rewired as a part of those kids singing, of those kids performing, and those kids being engaged here at Fraser. We need to be a safe place for people that that means that we need to take care of our own mental health. Therapy is absolutely a tool. Medication is sometimes needed. And hospitalization is sometimes needed. I do need to do a disclaimer because there are some folks you really can't be in a relationship with. You can't be in a relationship with someone who's in active addiction. 
If you live with a family member who's in active addiction, you need to go find an Al-Anon family group. You really can't be in a relationship with someone with a serious mental illness who's off their medication. You need to find a good NAMI group. Those individuals, those folks can help you sort that out. The first seven years of my life were re relationally rich and served as a buffer as I got older. I was very lucky that my grandmother really took care of me from birth. At my birth, my mother experienced a bout of postpartum depression before people really even understood what that was. If you wanna talk about how things shape mental health, she also was in a car accident and sustained a traumatic brain injury at age 15. She got married between her junior and senior year in high school, had two kids by the age of 20 and divorced by the age of 23. So a few life experiences that might have affected her mental health. My father's coping mechanism was drinking, which of course always caused more problems. But I always got dropped off at my grandmother's, which turned out to be a great thing. We moved in with my grandparents when my parents divorced. It was a great time for us because there were so many people around. We had a 15-year-old uncle who lived in the house. We had an aunt and uncle who lived next door. We got up every morning very early and ate a big, huge breakfast complete with homemade biscuits and gravy. Everybody came home for lunch to eat together. It was a textbook prescription for connectedness and it helped rewire my brain and it was the foundation that I would go back to. In conclusion, I stand here before you today to tell you that I would not change a thing not one single thing. The first seven years created a solid foundation that I keep coming back to. That tiny little church served as a beacon during a very dark time, and the fellowship of Al-Anon brought me back to my father. I have to admit, though, I have to confess, because there's some people in the room who know me, fellowship is still hard for me. It absolutely is still hard for me. Those who are in my Sunday school class and are in my Bible study know that fellowship is still hard for me because of the trust issues. I can tell you that the only time my job is ever stressful is when I forget who's really in charge. <laughs> if I get up every day and turn the day over to my Heavenly Father, things go really great. If I don't, it can go off the rails in a big hurry. Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what he's now doing, the saving of lives. God created us to be in relationship. You have the power to change people's lives through relationships. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a part of this summit. And put your phones down and go have conversations with people today. Thank you.